Good evening and welcome to the Seth Jordan Show. Well, well, well. Hey, listen, I know a lot of people aren't going to be tuned in tonight. Our Phillies are getting ready for a game seven down at the bank tonight. But we're just going to move forward, you know, and talk about our Philadelphia Eagles. Before we jump into the Eagles, though, let's kind of have a little chat about, um, you know, what's transpiring. Um, I don't know if you guys, you know, realize, but the um i want to say four of the top six teams lost last week um you had the lions taking on a loss um well maybe that was the week before you got the bills the 49ers are five and two the bills are four and three and the dolphins obviously lost to the eagles this week and they're now sitting at five and two um, I think things are starting to shake out, you know, as you watch the season progress and we're actually getting to that time of the season, you know, where the rubber kind of meets the road. Um, November, December is winning months. Got to start positioning yourself, you know, for the playoffs, trying to get the best seed that you can get. And I think some things are starting to, um, starting to come to fruition here as far as, you know, where teams are, where teams are headed and what teams are looking like. Um, I can't tell you what the heck is going on with the Buffalo Bills. So much um, expectation there um, for that team and all the talent that they have. Um, the 49ers, um, you know, Kirk Cousins took them down on Sunday night football, or Monday night football last night um, in dramatic fashion. Um, Brock Purdy is starting to look a little bit um, like everyone was waiting for him to look like. Um, a couple of interceptions last night at crucial points in the game. Um, not very much running game out of San Francisco the last two weeks. And, um, and he struggled somewhat. And then, of course, you know, your, um, your the Detroit Lions um, falter last week as well. And, um, you know, I, I keep trying to tell people, they go in to play the Ravens, and the Ravens actually just take them completely apart. And I've been saying, as far as Jared Goff is concerned, you know, for the same reasons that um, that Sean McVay shipped him off, those are going to be the same things and the same reasons why, you know, all, although the Detroit Lions, I believe, are a good football team and they're moving up through the ranks, I still believe that Jared Goff is going to be um, their Achilles heel when it's all said and done because he's pressure adverse. And I think that every other team in the league understands that. Sean McVay knew that. That's why he got rid of him. They lost in the Super Bowl. Jared just, you know, did not play well against the pressure that Bill Belichick brought at him. Um, if you leave him in the pocket and you give him time, he can certainly hurt you. But when you apply pressure, be it via the blitz or whether you're just getting great pressure, um, against their offensive line, sooner or later he's going to falter and give you those bad games. And and when you get into the biggest games, when they're playing some of the top teams in the National Football League, that's what you're going to face. The Miami Dolphins. I said last week that, you know, um, this had to be a physical game for the Philadelphia Eagles because in my mind, the Miami Dolphins pretty much are a, um, a finesse football team. They're no different than the run and shoot of my day, the K gun, the red gun, you know, all of these spread them out and throw the ball all over the map. Um, Tyreek Hill is a different animal. There's just no doubt about it, you know, but I take my hat off and I tip my cap to Sean Desai and what he was able to do. Um, I think he formulated a game plan that pretty much 
uh, most teams around the National Football League can now implore. Um, if you can keep them from making big plays down the field and you can put them in a situation where you can confuse Tua with coverages, put them in situations where you take away their running game. Listen, they average 181 yards a game coming into that Sunday night game. The Eagles defense held them, held them to 45 yards total rush offense on the ground. And to me, that's a big deal. That's a big deal because you know what? It begins to take away play action pass. That's what two is. He wants to fake the ball, turn around, throw the ball on time, throw it on rhythm. Wasn't able to do it because there was no play action there because he couldn't run the football. So there's no need to, you know, for the Eagles defense to even honor the fact that he may do that. Um, right now, the, your Philadelphia Eagles are residing at um, six and one, and they are the number one um team in the national football conference right now now of course they got to keep pace they got a heck of a schedule coming up they got washington then they got dallas on uh on the late game um then they got their bye and then they come back and i believe they got uh, kansas city out of the bye they've got um the bills the 49ers um there is um they got the cowboys again um, in Seattle, those will probably be, you know, their toughest, toughest, um, you know, couple of games um, of the season. We're going to find out who they are, what they are, and how they present themselves to the rest of the National Football League based upon how they handle the next, you know, six to seven weeks of the game. Again, this is the Seth Jordan Show brought to you by Bet Parks. Um, please go to the, um, my, the Seth Jordan Show YouTube page. Um, click those likes, um, share it, you know, with those who don't know about it. And most importantly, I would love if you guys would follow uh, what's going on. Not only do I have my podcast here, but if you happen to miss the Seth Joyner show that's on channel 17 at NBC Sports Philly, um, I normally post that show here, the 30 minute show each week. So you guys can see that is usually posted by the end of the week. Um, so let's jump back into, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles and what we saw. Of, of course, I want to start on the defensive side of the ball. And normally what I do is I start on the offensive side because, you know, that's the focal point. But the truth of the matter is this, this Eagles defense has just been downright dominant. Back-to-back -back weeks, um, they've only allowed a total of 244 yards total offense. Now, I know I picked Miami to win. And most of my decision last week was – that was my pick because of how they played against the New York Jets and the proficiency and the explosiveness of that Miami defense, that Miami offense, rather. Um, I don't think very many people saw the Eagles going into this game and beating up on the Miami Dolphins the way that they did. Um, to me, I get the sense that they've kind of turned the corner somewhat. And, and let me just say this, you know, in, in an imperfect game, we're all the media, the fans, everybody. We're waiting for the Eagles to put together this perfect game. And I don't think that there is such thing as a perfect game. Um, the one thing that the Eagles know how to do is they, they know how to win. You know, Jalen Hurts knows how to win. I don't care what befalls him, a fumble, an interception. He's going to keep battling and trying to find a way to win. Um, the defense, uh, I, get, I tip my hat to Sean Desai, big time. Because with all of the moving parts that he's had in the secondary this year, um, he's figured out a way to not only improve the defense from where they were last year from statistically, but to also bring down the numbers. The Eagles started the season, they gave up three 300-yard passing outings, you know, the first three games of the season. Their average is now down to about a 230 yards per game, okay? Last year, they gave up 121 yards per game on the ground. They're averaging somewhere in the 155 to 160, you know, range. I mean, 60, 55 to 60 yards per game average is what their average is, what they're giving up right now. Now, when you can dominate the line of scrimmage the way that they've dominated the line of scrimmage, kudos to, you know, um, all those guys up front, led by the leader, Fletcher Cox, you know, no doubt about it. Jalen Carter is the talk du jour. But let me tell you something. Jordan Davis is making his mark. 
and people need to like open their eyes and realize that this dude is a straight up player. Not only is he dominating in the run game, and I'm and my breakdown today, uh, when I get to my whiteboard breakdown, I'm basically going to talk to you guys about you know what's going on up front. So we won't have anything on the outside, no offense. All we got is the defensive line and the offensive line, and I'm going to give you some ideas about you know why they're so dominant against the run right now. Um, and a lot of it has to do with Jordan Davis, believe it or not, especially when they're in their five-man front. But Jordan Davis has played well. Um, um, uh, Milton Williams has played well. Um, when Tui Palutu is healthy, he's played extremely well. And the most exciting part, the most exciting part is the fact that, you know, the defensive ends, both Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat, are now turning up the sw- the the, the – the pressure, no doubt about it. Um, sweat is just all over the place. And Hassan Reddick, I mean, he had two of the four, um, sweat that is, he had two of the four sacks the Eagles had last week. Um, and I think he's now tied with Hassan Reddick for the lead at five and a half. Um, Hassan Reddick was everywhere in the run game, in the pass game. And even though he didn't get home last week for any sacks, I'm telling you, he is disruptive. In the in the in the in the run game, um, he was a pivotal player last week. In the pass game, you know his pressure is causing other guys to eat. And then you know they dropped him in coverage a couple of times, and he came up and made tackles. You know after a flat a flat drop. So I'm telling you right now, this team is rounding into shape. And last, last but certainly not least, I'm gonna take my hat off for this one, and then I'm gonna put it back on. Howard Roseman, dude is on fire. How in the world, how in the world do you swindle the Tennessee Titans out of Kevin Byer? How do you get him for Edmonds, Terrell Edmonds, a fifth and a sixth rounder, a guy who is a pro bowler, a productive player, a guy who's never been hurt in his entire career? Now, Philadelphia Eagle, he gives us depth now. Can you imagine what that, what that, Safety position is going to look like with Reed Blankenship on one side and Kevin Byard on the other side. Uh, this move is just phenomenal. Um, another guy I want to give some kudos to um, Eli Ricks. Eli Ricks, when given the opportunity last week, stepped up big time. When I say big time, I mean big time. He got up on Tariq Hill, jammed him, ran with him, challenged him, hit him so much more so than um um than bradbury and slay and you know that's just phenomenal to me that a young guy maybe he doesn't know any better and maybe he plays with no fear but it seemed like the corners on the outside were just trying to keep um tyreek hill in front of him like most teams do rather than challenging him. um he put his pants on just like every, anybody else i said it last week a lot of people didn't agree with me um in the pregame and postgame, me and Derek Gunn kind of got into it a little, a, a little bit. You know, he kept talking about how prolific um, of a player Tyreek Hill is. Listen, you know, as, as much as the game has changed, there's some components about the game that are the same. Um, I wanted to see somebody lay some wood on him because you see him, if he doesn't think he can run by you, he'll run out of bounds because he doesn't want to get hit. So somebody needs to lay some wood on him. That'll slow him down. But Eli Ricks, man, I think that, you know, with the Bayern acquisition and Eli Ricks stepping up against one of the best wide receivers in the National Football League, they not only have depth um, once they get Bradley Roby back and healthy, but they've got a guy in Eli Ricks that I think you can you can move around if need be. If you got an injury at cornerback, you can play him there. If you got an injury in the slot, you can play him there. Um, I was very impressed by what I saw from him when he finally got his chance to get on the field and show what he could do. Josiah Scott, another guy, off someone's practice squad, right into the starting role in the slot last week, and we didn't hear his name. Now, a lot of people will say, well, what did he do? If you don't hear his name, he didn't do anything. That meant that he played a good game, that he did something right, that the broadcast didn't say, oh, Josiah Scott got toasted over here, Josiah Scott missed the tackle, Josiah Scott... You didn't hear anything from him. So that meant he was doing something well, okay? 
the linebackers were kind of quiet, still waiting for um, the Kobe Dean to flash. Um, really didn't see a whole lot. I saw Zach Cunningham got beat. Um, what looked like it was going to be a touchdown. Darius Slay comes off his guy and makes an interception. Great play. Great play by Slay um, to have the awareness. I don't know what the route was and why you had two guys in the same area like that because if Slay's guy goes to the post, that's a touchdown. Um, it was evident to me that Zach Cunningham was 100% beat or they were going to get a PI and they was going to get the ball right there on the one-yard line. Game-changing play by Darius Slay. All right, so let's jump over on the offensive side of the ball. Um, I, I I don't know what's going on with Jalen Hurts. I'm not sure. Um, but, and I don't, you know, I, I, I what I want to see him do is play the game from the pocket. Um, I think that the protection could be better, and I'm never going to move off the, the belief that we've had, we have the best um, offensive line in the Nas National Football League. And I don't know, you know, Lane Johnson, I believe, gave up his first sack in the last two years last week um, to the Phillips kid. But, you know, I'm going to chalk that up to a bad ankle and him not being able to to plant or, or you know, get back down inside. Um, but I kind of feel like Joy Malata is getting pushed back a little bit. I, I just get the sense that, you know, the offensive line needs to up their – their intensity a little bit when it comes to the pass rush because when i'm looking at jalen he looks uncomfortable he looks um rushed at times happy feet you know last year he was really successful because you know he could stand in the pocket or sure that he was going to have time to get the ball down the field um a lot of people say hey you know the sack that he took held on to the ball too long the interception just you know a a, a bad throw but I, I, I kind of get the sense that, you know, he's he's not himself right now. Um, he's not 100 percent health wise. I think that's got something to do with it. Um, but if they're going to throw the ball, I just think that the offensive line has got to be just a smidge more solid than what they've been. Um, they're good. They're great. Um, not taking anything away from them. Just an observation. Um, A.J. Brown is an absolute beast. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, you know, why teams aren't doubling this guy and making the Eagles beat them with someone else, with Devontae Smith, who struggled a little bit, had another drop the other night. Dallas got it, five targets, five catches, 77 yards, and a touchdown. He's starting to show up a little more, um, you know, in the offense. But I think in order for this offense to really be uh, what it truly can be, um, Devontae Smith, and I believe he will, needs to find um, his rhythm, um, you know, because he's a big piece of the puzzle and he's too good not to be. He needs to find his rhythm in his offense, and they got to get him going again. Um, and, of course, we got to figure out how to get some production, um, you know, out of the slot position. Al Alameda Zacchaeus, you know, is not giving us a whole lot right now. Um, I don't know that they're asking him for a whole lot. I think he was targeted one time and, Hurts threw him a bad ball. He wasn't able to bring it on. Um, Julio Jones had one catch, um, still getting himself familiar with the offense. Um, but I think slowly but surely, the offense is rounding into shape. We're balanced, run the pass last week. That's why I believe that, you know, the offense had um, such success. And they, in my opinion, they got to continue to do that. Um what else? The running backs, you know, wasn't spectacular, but, you know, like I said, they were committed to the run. I mean, they only averaged 2.9 yards a carry, but they ran the ball, I believe, 33 times, you know, for 99 yards. That's enough to keep defenses honest, in my opinion. And I do believe if they made more of a more of a commitment to um, to be able to, you know, get DeAndre Swift going um, and maybe even we need to see some some Boston Scott, you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not seeing what I saw at the end of the year out of Kenny Gainwell. Um, and I believe that Boston Scott, you know, is that guy that can light some fire under him if they start giving Boston those touches instead of allowing um, um, Kenny Gainwell to get them all. Um, the game plan for the Eagles was phenomenal. I said last week that if, they, if Miami had the ball um, more than 10 possessions, that there's no way that they can win this game. The Eagles' defense 
com in, in the complementary offense because of the way that they ran ran the football. I want to say they had a 12 play drive, another 12 play drive, um, and a 13 play drive, um, and those were huge. Those are clock chewers. Um, and that's how you have to play complementary football when you're talking about a high-powered offense like Miami. Is you got to minimize the amount of possessions that they had, and they only had eight. All right. So let's jump to um, a commercial right quick. When I come back, um, we're going to jump into our um, our whiteboard 101. I want to do that because once I get Jaws in, um, I want to give him time. Um, to talk about what he'd like to talk about. And maybe, you know, if you guys fire up some questions, um, we'll have some questions for Jaws and let him answer your questions, all right? See you in a sec. When you open the Bet Parks app, you're in the zone. Winning is always a rush, but the money is in the moment. It's the confidence and underdogs covering, the tension before a clutch turnover, and the pride of a parlay paying off. It's another chance to win big with all-day action. Plus, win your first $10 bet and get $125 in sports bonus bets. You play for fun, you love to win. You bet. Bet Parks. If you understand that success is built on trusted relationships and dependable performance, MidPen Bank is the right bank for you. We're on a mission to prove that the right bankers can make a big difference. We work harder, we get things done, and we're in your corner. With financial centers strategically located throughout the greater Philadelphia region and new locations in central New Jersey, we're ready to bring you the best in commercial and personal banking. Call or visit us today to connect with a professional MidPen banker. Member FDIC. Go Eagles! Welcome to Bridgeview Partners, where IT and business innovation merge. We're not just another tech company. We're your strategic partner in navigating the ever-evolving digital landscape. Our team of experts tailors cutting-edge solutions to fit your unique needs, and ensuring your success is our top priority. Elevate your business with Bridgeview Partners. Discover the power of partnership and tech innovation today. Contact us now to experience the difference. Bridgeview Partners, where innovation meets excellence. All right, welcome back, guys. Um, again, this is the Seth Joyner Show. The video cast podcast brought to you by bet parks um so in our breakdown today i think one of the um you know someone on social media asked me today would i do a breakdown um of why the eagles have been so good against the run um and i'm going to give you two examples tonight one of them is going to be out of a four-man front one's out of five-man front and let's start with the five-man front okay so you got a defensive end and defensive end. You got um, Jordan Davis um, on the nose. Um, Fletcher Cox usually plays out here on a three, even though it's, it's flipped over. He usually plays on the left side. But I'm going to put, you know, put a tackle here. And let's just say um, that we've got, you know, one of the other defensive tackles there. And if you got two linebackers in, on, on the field, sometimes in their five men, they'll go two linebackers. You know, other times, you know, they'll go one linebacker um, and drop a safety in late. But let's just give you the two linebacker look um, to begin with. OK. Um, let's put the quarterback under center back here and let's go with a strong side run. Quarterback reverses out, hands the ball here. And if they're going to zone it more times than not, you're going to get a cut off here. He's going to try to cut off. Um, or they'll, they'll try to double, try to cut off here. Okay. Um, work to get front side here with a double team and then work up to the backer. Okay. But what Jordan Davis is doing, he's stuffing this guy right here so much and he's pushing him in the backfield, which actually means that there's no cutback no cutback for this run at all because he's cutting the field in half. So this play nine times out of 10, it has to stay front side. Okay. So this linebacker thing he's got to do is he's got to get front side in this gap. So this guy's going to work to the outside shoulder and then try to cut him off, but he's got to rip outside. So now you see everybody's got a gap contain, got a gap, you know, he's going to double team and push. OK, 
So this linebacker, as he flows, he's got to check this A gap, first of all, and then he's a free hitter to the ball. Now, whether it's Fletcher Cox or whether it's um, Jordan Davis, they've been stout right here. The problem is they're not pushing the line at all. They're not getting any movement. You know, and really when you run the ball, it's really about movement. You hold the edge here, so anything that bounces outside, you're there for it. Um, and this is, in their five-man front, how they are actually keeping um, teams' run games under control. Okay, so let's click out of it, and let's put the, the tight end over here this time, okay? And give you, I'll give you your four-man look. So here's your in, your in. Fletcher is usually lined up in a three. Jordan Davis is usually lined up in a one or two, okay? And then you got a linebacker and a linebacker, okay? So let's let's go again with the strong side run. Here's your quarterback, okay? Quarterback reverses out, hands the ball here. So now you can see the double, the double, double team in this scenario because these two guys, he's got contained. He's got to stay outside. So now you got a double team. That is working. This guy's going to try to work face up. He's going to clip the outside shoulder and work up next level. This linebacker's got to rip and get into um, this C gap right here. Now you got the same thing here. He's going to work to get flush up on this defensive tackle. He's going to clip the shoulder and then he's got to work a gap to flow. All right. Now he's got to stay backside. So where's the cutback? If you don't get the push and this guy cuts it back. Here's the cutback. That's the home run lane. This is where the safety is responsible for anything that comes here. But again, you got Jordan Davis here just pushing so hard, and he's causing this guy really not to even get up to the next level of the linebacker. So what, what winds up happening, again, stalemate right here. Sometimes he even pushes and cuts the whole cutback off, and the guy's got to stay front side. And if this linebacker's on his horse, he gets down here, takes the double team off. He's got the B gap. Now you got a guy in this gap. You got a guy in this gap. This linebacker rips in this gap, and he's outside contained. Where is there to run? There's nowhere at all to run the football. Nowhere at all. Um, so now you can understand why this defense, and I'm not sure, but they've got to be ranked either first or second in the NFL in run defense. And I think they're somewhere around 50 to 60 yards yards per game um, is what they're giving up. That's a massive change because last year they gave up 121 yards per game rushing the football. That's only going to help them as far as the passing game is concerned because when these teams that really like to go play action pass realizes that they can't play action, well, guess what? They just go to straight drop back. Now I can just tell my defensive lineman, hey, pin your ears back. Let's go get them because they can't run. They know they can't run, and we know that they can't run. So let's just go get the quarterback, all right? That's our one-on-one -on -one breakdown for the day. Got my man Jaws in with me tonight. Jaws, what's happening? Seth, Seth, great to be with you. I got to tell you, I don't know why you waste all that time trying to gain four or five yards, man. Drop back and throw it. See, man, there you go. <laughs> spoken spoken like a true quarterback. Yeah, so, right. Jaws, listen, listen, I, um, I heard that, you know, Howard Eskin was a little disrespectful to me today on WIP, and I got a little something for him later on. But, you know, I researched this stat, and, you know, the top teams in the NFL right now, the teams with the best record, they all reside in the top 12 of rushing in the National Football League this year, okay? Conversely, the top three teams in running the football in the National Football League are the Miami Dolphins, the Philadelphia Eagles, and the San Francisco 49ers. They rank one, two, and three. And in my opinion, you know, you got to bring Kansas City into, you know, th th those, those four teams are the four top teams in the league. Now, you played in the era where, you know, it was no doubt about it. You were going to run the football, and then you were going to, um, you know, you were going to pass off the run. The run was going to set up the pass. And I get it. It's a new age. But I kind of get the sense that, you know, when I'm watching um, today's NFL, that, you know, we're kind of reverting back to a little more of the run game, specifically teams who have quarterbacks that are still developing. Your thoughts? 
Yeah, it, it certainly depends when you run the football. I, I, I've always believed. You know, I, I think a coach that I played for, like, you know, Chuck Knox, Buddy Ryan, Dick Vermeil, Don Shula, Marty Schottenheimer. Those are coaches that have won close to a thousand games. Think of that, Seth. Coaches that have won over close to a thousand games. So they kind of know what they're doing. And none of those coaches were ever kind of like, hey, let's just let's just drop back and throw the ball around. And I think they all understood. And and I learned, you know, we learned from our coaches and how they taught the game. And there's a, the game of football is a violent, physical game. And if you lose that part of your game, it's hard to win championships. You may be successful over a short period of time. You'll be successful over a long period of time. But I don't think you're going to win a championship by being a one-dimensional football team. So I, I've always believed you have to run the football to be physical. And that sets a, that sets, sets a tempo up for what we like to call explosive plays. You know, you played on the opposite side of the ball. You're on defense. And you know once your linebackers start cheating up, you know when those safeties start cheating up, and you stick that ball out and pull it back in, that's when you get these. The big explosive play. So I think you run the football to develop an identity, a physical identity, a dominating identity that, hey, we're going to run the ball no matter what you think we're going to do. We can run it if we want to. When those safeties start cheating up, linebackers start peeking in the backfield. They're hitting the run. Now you get the wheel routes. Now you get those man-to-man wheel routes. You get the big explosive plays on the middle of the field. It all comes off being set up by the running game and the physical nature of the game. It is In your opinion, is it the – is it the analytics of today? Is it the fact that you know you're paying your quarterbacks on average about fifty million dollars a year? How much? That you know. That, How that, much that, you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, we're gonna send you back to the future, Jaws. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to go back to the future myself. <laughs> I'll just throw a little side note in since we got up on salaries here. You can talk quarterbacks, I'll talk money, right? So in 1980, after we go to the Super Bowl, I'm the league MVP. I get a new contract. Two million dollars over five years, four hundred thousand a year. Seth, I was the highest paid player in the NFL. Right behind my, my wall, my office, there's, there's a, a, an article. Jaws, highest paid player in the NFL, four hundred thousand. That's tip money now. <laughs> Listen, I, I, you, you're preaching to the choir. You know, if I tell you what I made my first two years, I signed a two year deal, eighth round draft pick. I made fifty five and sixty six thousand my 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 first two years in the league with a fifteen thousand dollars signing bonus Man, so I, you're, you're, big you're, time though. you're, you're <laughs> preaching to the choir and i i really thought i had some cake man but i'm just i'm thinking you know what you say make, makes a whole lot of sense to me but it seems to me that you know a lot of these teams today they are so hell-bent on just throwing the football without setting it up you know, they just want to pass it. And then there, there's this adage out there that you throw the ball often and early to get a lead, and then that's, you run your ball in four-minute offense. The, the Cowboys in the 90s, that's what they did. They they threw the ball early. It wasn't Emmitt Smith grinding it out early in the game. He put the game away. They were a play-action pass team early. They knew Emmitt was going to get the ball eventually. But their whole idea was let's play with a lead. And it also helps the defense. When you're hey, – you know you've done better, better than anybody – you're up 14 nothing. Hey, bring it on. I, you're not playing run anymore. You're, you're playing pass. You can now play all the games you want to do with a, a lead. So, you know, in, in the 90s, that philosophy worked. It, it, I don't think it's, it works as, to, as much in today's game, but I still think it was a very valuable way to, do, to run an offense and a team. Yeah, but there's a lot of teams that still do it, Jaws. Like, I mean, the Eagles went into the Jets game, and, you know, um, you know, you, you, I was flabbergasted that you're against the 29th ranked run defense in the National Football League, they came out and called 51 call running plays versus 18 called um, run plays. And really, um, the running backs only touched the ball um, four times, 14 times, because four of those were were Jalen Hurts run. Um, And I see teams all the time. They fall in love with the run and, and it works. I get it. You know, there's no foolproof way of doing this because sometimes you can come out and run the ball to set up the pass. But there's other times where it's to your greatest advantage to come out and run the football. It brings play action, play action passing yeah. alive and everything else. Um, why not do it that way, especially for a young quarterback? You ask a young quarterback to drop back 40 times in a game, you're asking for trouble. Oh, you're going to make all kinds of mistakes. And, and defense is in, in – you know, today right now what you're seeing, there's no more base defense. There's no more 4-3. Everything's – you know multiple defensive backs on the field. So you, why would you want to invite that? To me, that plays the defense. I still kind of like base formations. I still like to have the 
a tight end next to my tackle. I still like to have a back next to my other tackle. So there's always an option for protection. And oh, by the way, what I saw the other night when I went through the tape, which I watched my game tape right here, Vic Fangio, I, I watched what he did to Jalen Hurts. So I wanted to, see Vic, you know, Vic Fangio was here last year in Philadelphia as the mm-hmm. quote unquote consultant for the Eagles. Now he's the defensive coordinator for the Miami Dolphins. I wanted to see how he was going to play Jalen Hurts because who would know better? The guy that was a consultant for the Eagles that was with him every day that watched other teams do to try to stop him. So what he did, I said, the minute the Eagles went to a zero, an empty, empty set, he blitzed. He didn't blitz. He didn't. He, he blitzed him forty-one percent in the game, which is a pretty high number of blitzes. But I, it, I'm, I'm looking for a tell on what Vic Fangio was thinking about Jalen Hurts. He got after him with pressure. When there were no backs in the backfield, he attacked him with the pass. So, I, I, and and all season long, the one thing we've been seeing with Jalen, because of you know the, when the Eagles do get pass happy at times, I think they forget about the run. They forget about the running back. Although I would find a way to get down to slip the ball twenty times a game. But when it showed me that I think Vic in the back of his mind said, you know what we got to do? We've got to rattle Jalen Hurts. And, and Jalen, as an example, last week against the Jets, when Lane Johnson went out and Driscoll came in, there was quick pressure on that right side. Jalen became a little antsy in the pocket when he didn't have that comfortable pocket, that nice cushion to plant, step and throw. So I think teams see if you can get pressure on Jalen, you could break him down a little bit early in his, in his development as far as the pass read goes. Charles, I know that, you know, pressure on quarterbacks is is their, you know, kryptonite to Superman yep. anyway. You know, so that's why, you know, you hear me talk about, you know, pressure, pressure, pressure. And I think some people believe that I just want to blitz all the time. But I understand what pressure does um, to quarterbacks. It speeds up their thinking. It speeds up their processing. It speeds up their decision making, which which causes, you know, mistakes. Um, but. You know, the thing the thing I'm seeing as far as, you know, when you talk about that empty set, you know, they kept bringing number 52 on the delayed blitz. Yep. So my question is, you know, back in the day, I know the teams had, um, you know, side adjustments, you know, when you could read that or over time because they did it quite a few times. It was automatic. The quarterback would turn and look at his wide receiver on each side and they'd adjust to, you know, if the cornerback was off, they adjust to a slant. If the cornerback was up, they'd adjust to a fade. If he was off and inside, you know, he'd stick him and run the speed out. You had these adjustments. Sometimes I don't see the Eagles sight adjust so much. It's almost like, you know, we're going to pick it up. And when when, they, when they're in blitz, we're going to take shots down the field. We're going to try to hurt you in those situations rather than, you know, taking the sight adjustment. Mm-hmm. Do they even have sight adjustments yes. built it, into it, their it, offense? In general, Seth, I would make the statement, yes, they do. But there have been situations where I haven't seen the sight adjustment. I don't know if it was on or off, depending on the protection scheme they had called. But I think what to your your viewers and listeners, a site adjust, and I'm sure you've explained it down the road, is when they bring more than you can block. If there's say two to one side and you only have one blocker, the ball's got to come out. The receiver can't run a 20 yard dig route because the quarterback's going to be on his back in the backfield. So you must site adjust. Okay, they bring two, we can only block one. The wide receiver must site adjust his route. And a lot of offenses, I, I played in a number of offenses where there's built in site adjusts. It may not be the side adjust to the side of the hot, but you would throw it backside knowing that you're not going to have time to throw the football. The minute that back foot hits, it's got to come out. And that's that's where some quarterbacks get caught. They're not aware the hot has got to happen quicker. It's called hot for a reason. You guys on defense want to heat the quarterback up. So you better get the ball out of your hand or you're going to get heated up. Josh, listen, I um so you know. In an imperfect game, and football is definitely an imperfect game. Um, I said it, you know, in my open, opening monologue. I think that, you know, we as fans and the media and whatnot, we want to see the Eagles play this perfect game. But the game is imperfect because you got opposition on the other side. They get paid just like us, you know, to be able to stop you. And and sometimes you can have the best play called, you know, and they figure out a way, you know, to 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 stalemate or to stop it. Um, I get the sense that the Philadelphia Eagles on offense are rounding into shape. And I'm kind of, you know, it, it's high inside now. You know, the best thing that could have happened is the loss to the Jets. And the best thing that could have happened for this team, in my opinion, was the struggles throughout the first half of the season. But I get the sense that they're in a place now where, um, you know, Nick and, and, and Brian Johnson are figuring and understanding how important the run game is. You know, they only had 99 yards on the ground, even though they rushed it for over 30 times last week for 2.9 yards per carry. But it's important 
um, for the offense, for the defense, rather, to believe that you might still run the football um, just to keep them honest. Um, but I get the sense that they're starting to round into shape. A.J. Brown is unstoppable. I get it. But they got to figure out a way to get Deon De 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 Devontae Smith, you know, get him going. And even Dallas Goddard's numbers, you know, he had five targets last week. Hey, let's seven, get seven yards. Julio Jones, you know, like, come on. Are yep. you kidding me? Get the ball, Devontae Smith. You nail it. Get it to Dallas Goddard. But the, in, in talking in a general term about the team, the one thing I am concerned is the, their ball security has not been good. They're just averaging under two turnovers a game. You mm. know, they're winning games that they're going to lose down the road against a quality football team. So they learn got to learn how to take care of the football. Now, some of that is Jalen. Some of it's been some bad luck, batted balls, a tip ball, ball knockers out of his hand. Those things do happen. But I think ball security is definitely number one. And, and I, I said this Sunday night, I think the Super Bowl this year will be the Miami Dolphins against the Philadelphia Eagles. Mm. When, when these two teams – look at – you know, we, okay, we beat Miami. Both their corners are out. Jalen Ramsey and Xavier Howard were both, both out of that game. Those are two shutdown corners. So that – okay, we beat them, but they'll be back. Their left side of their offensive line, left tackle, left guard, and the center were all out. I want to see the Miami Dolphins with their full complement of players against the Eagles, full complement of players. Now that we have, you know, the, the addition of Bayard coming in safety, it, what a difference it was with, with Slay being healthy the other night. So I, I think that the two best rosters when healthy are the Dolphins and the Eagles. Hmm. That that would be a heck of a matchup. I can tell you that. There's no doubt. <laughs> there, there's, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, um, when they get that other running back that they've got down there in Miami back, I I'm not so that. sure that he's. Yeah, I'm not so sure that he's not better than than most of. I think he is. <laughs> I think uh, it, it, I, I tell you, watch that. You know, when you watch these this Dolphin team, I mean, they are fast. I mean, every one of those guys can fly. And Tua, I was impressed with Tua. He made he made a bonehead play on the interception. You know, late in the game, I don't know where he was throwing the ball. He had no right throwing it there. But for the most part, he was quick. He was decisive. When I studied the tape of him, you know, going into the game, I mean, the guy gets the ball out of his hand. He's hard to sack, and he's been thrown with accuracy. So, I, you know, he's definitely matured. And at offense, they, McDaniel run is pretty crazy. They do some wild stuff. But at the end of the day, you as a defensive guy know. And I think what I'm seeing, the evolution of what defenses do, they're not getting caught up in all the motion and all mm -hmm. the shifts. They're basically staying home and just sliding around, sliding around, making sure that they've got every area of the field covered. You'd be a lot better at breaking down that defensive scheme, but – they're not getting caught, you know, making all these calls when there's a shift, making all these calls in motion. It's pretty basic. Stay at home, maintain your area on the field. Well, Jaws, I tell people all the time, you know, one of the things that gets most defensive players beat when they're playing in the game is eye discipline. Like if I'm lined up and I'm off the ball, I'm reading through an uncovered lineman to the quarterback to the back. Um, when you start getting all that motion that's going all over the place, all of a sudden, you know, your eyes get a little undisciplined. You start looking at the motion and all of a sudden you move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's really what it is. I mean, it, it's hard to train defensive players to keep their focus right there. You know, it takes time, you know, especially for young players to understand that, you know, if that motion doesn't affect you, there's no reason for you to look at it. Stay locked in, you know, on your key. Your key is going to tell you what's going on. Now, I, you watched the game the other night. You know, Eli Ricks is a guy who's been, you know, kind of hadn't gotten a whole lot of playing time. I thought he played phenomenal last 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 week. Um, a couple of times he got up um, on Tyreek Hill and gave him the business, you know, where our starting cornerback seemed like they didn't want any all day long. And I don't know whether they have the option to get up or get back or whether they're told to play a certain way or not. But Eli Ricks, man, he, he Jaws, he looked like he didn't have much fear in him. Well, I, I thought that secondary as a whole had a, had a tremendous game. I mean, I, I, I thought they I thought they played great because, you know, and a while gets hurt. It takes a little bit away from you know what Miami has as far as firepower. But, man, some of those young guys did not have a whole lot of snaps. You know, I mean, look, look at what they had to do. Sidney Brown asked him in there. Yeah, I was inactive for a couple of weeks. And he's flying around the field. You know, he's, make, he's making plays. I, I didn't expect 50 some plays out of him. That's what he played. And, he, and you know, he didn't embarrass himself. You know, he did a damn good job. You're playing against a Miami team that is you know, averaging just under 500 yards a game. You know, I'd have brown stains in my pants when I was in that secondary, you know. <laughs> it, it's it's tough covering that group. They did a hell of a job. But let, hey, you know you know where the rubber meets the road, Seth. Oh, yeah. Pass, oh, yeah. rush, pressure. Yeah. Pass, rush, pressure. That calms everything down in that secondary. If you're in that secondary and you know you can get a, a four-man rush, 
get pressure on the quarterback, force him to get rid of the football, man, that's a plus. And I thought the defensive line was disciplined. They got their hands up. They caused Tua to move a little bit. It doesn't have to be a lot, but just move his head a little bit. So you look to find a lane to throw the football into. I thought the pass rush was really, really good. And they didn't have to blitz. They only blitzed four times in the game. So there wasn't a whole lot of blitzing going on. I'm all over the place. I thought the side did a good job. All right. I'm all over the place tonight. But anyway, let's go back over to the – Let's, let's go back over to the offensive. We're all over the place. <laughs> let's jump back over to the offensive side of the ball. Um, you talked about Jalen not being comfortable um, at times. You know, I see the same thing. He does. He looks rushed sometimes. He didn't really play that way last year. Um, give me your assessment on how the defense played. I, I know Lane Johnson was hurt last week, but I think he gave him his first sack in two years. And yep. from time to time, I kind of see. Um, I see Jordan Malata getting pushed back. And for a guy that's, you know, 350 pounds, I'm wondering why he's not anchoring. A lot of players are beginning because they can't get around him or beginning to, um, you know, power rush him. And it just doesn't make a whole bunch of sense to me. Um, give me your assessment of how the deep uh, offensive line has played, particularly in pass protection. Yeah, I, I think overall, Seth, they've been magnificent. Um, I, I really do. I, Malata... Yeah, he, he may give up a little bit of movement, but he, he's been rock solid. In fact, if, if you probably – he had a poor game against New England, as did Lane Johnson that game. They opened up the season with, with four games. But I think since then, they have been rock solid. Now, obviously, when Driscoll comes in for Lane, there's a, there's a significant drop-off because you're going from a guy that is likely to be an NFL Hall of Famer five years after his retirement. And then you go up, you, you kind of a journeyman guy in Driscoll. So it's a lot to ask a guy. However, that being said, they got to help Driscoll when he's out there. Put a, put a back on that side to chip. Put a tight end over there to take a little heat so you can't get that wide rush uh, on Jalen. So there are things they can do offensively, and I think the offensive coordination has been good this year. I, I sometimes get caught up with the play calling, but don't we all? Uh, but I, I think overall the offensive line has been really, really good. Opeta stepped in. He's done a really good job. Landon Dickerson, I watch. I love watching him. I mean, he just he balls people. I mean, he just, he got those big old broad shoulders, and, and that center might get that prop block standing up that nose tackle. And man, he will come down and – Crack three ribs, you know. I mean, that, that that's how he comes after people. So he's kind of that mall on the offensive line. But this offensive line, and I've said it after I think after the second or third game this year, when I saw Lane coming and getting better and all that and healthier, I said, Man, this is the best offensive line in football. And I'm saying that bar none. This is one hell of an offensive line. And you got to throw Dallas Goddard in there as well, because I always count that tight end as part of the offensive line. Mm -hmm. Now it's a good thing we had a good blocking offensive line because our backs when they're asked to block are very mediocre. <laughs> it's, it's 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 funny you mentioned the um you know offensive coordination and i was talking about it while i was watching the game on sunday um you know as, as a defensive player you know we don't know what the play is we've got to read and react and decipher what's going on in a millisecond you know so I, I, you know, in my film study, what I would do is I would break my days down. Wednesday was a run day. So I take all the cut ups from every formation and watch all the runs, chart every single one of them on my own, even though, you know, the analytics sheet, you know, they give you, you know, all of that information. Yeah. But, you know, back in the day, they didn't teach you how to read that stuff. They didn't think you really need to know it or understand it, it was more for the coaches than anybody else. But I would chart all of that stuff. And then on, on, um, on when, on Thursday, that was my pass day. I would go in and I watch all the pass cutups from every formation, every single play, and I chart every single one of them. And then as I went back by Friday and started looking at whole games again, I could begin to see a rhythm, you know, and some continuity to how teams, you know, were trying to attack, you know, our defense. If they ran, you know, um, 12 personnel and they were balanced, okay, and they ran the ball you know, right, 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 or left, 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 then, okay, they got the bootleg off of it, you know, and depending on which side was the best side, usually to the quarterback's right, you know, they're going to bootleg right. Um, if they went two tight ends and motion a guy or, you know, took the, the, the U off and brought him over and you got two tight ends, three receivers to one side, and they ran the ball, they usually had one or two plays off of that. Um, there are times that I'm watching this Eagles offense to me, it seems like there's no rhyme or reason to what they do. Like they came out in 12 personnel one time in the game and they ran a play and I waited and watched the entire game to see the play off of that because they had success with it. But I never saw the coordinated play off of that. Um, 
your eye is different from mine. You know, you see things, you know, as a quarterback, a heck of a lot different than I do. Um, talk to me about their, because you brought it up, talk to me about, you know, their coordination and, and, and how you see them coordinating their plays. Because sometimes they, they look to me like it's just schoolyard, man. They're just drawing it up in the dirt and we're better than you and we're just going to beat you with our, with our ability. I think at times, Seth, I, I, I've seen exactly what you're talking about, but I think for the most part, I felt there seems to be a rhyme and a rhythm and a reason for the play calling. As, as you know, when hey, if I'm calling plays against you, you know, hey, I, I got to know what you want to do. That pre-snap phase is so important. Because all that preparation, all that study you've done, all we getting ready. You know, where do you line up? You know, where did you line up as opposed to where Reggie White or Clyde Simmons was? Those things are all important. So we we talk too much about analytics. To me, analytics are about the past and the history. And, and that's that kind of bothers me because those guys that were the past and the history had nothing to do with me. So I'd like to, sit, to look at the team I'm going to play. What do they want to do against us? And we form, would formulate our game plan against them. And I think that's the analytics to me that, that I always felt was the most successful, not, you know, some guys at the, the Harvard Business School are breaking down position on the field and all that. that, that that's Those are guys that played the game before. You know, what about the game? I'm playing Seth Joyner. I'm worried about this sucker. I don't want him on the open side. I'm going to check the tight end over on his side because I don't want to give him free run at anybody. So, you know, the analytics is your preparation. Like you said, you would study your game plan. You would study your cut-ups, you know, and maybe for the, maybe for the, our, our, our viewers and listeners, cut-ups are, I just, I, you know, the, the most important down to me is third down. I would study the hell out of third and seven to 10 because I knew in that situation, that's around, that's, they, they're going to try to heat me up. So I thought that was the best situation where I had to spend, spend all my time. And third and one or two, I knew what we were going to do. Now we've got a Will Montgomery in the backfield or Harold Carmichael, the wide receivers. I'm going to go to one of those two guys. I don't care what the hell the defense is doing. You know, I like my matchup with Harold and anybody under six feet. You know, his, <laughs> his, he can touch the goalposts with, with his hands. And I know I had Will Montgomery. If I can get him in space, hey, he's going to give me he's going to give me a yard or two. So you got to know your talent, number one. You got to know your players, number one. And, 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 and not just say, oh, this is what – you know, this defense did last week against San Francisco. No, they're playing the Philadelphia Eagles. They're playing me today. So I, I think film preparation is absolutely the most important thing, at least from my perspective as a quarterback. I had to know. I had to know when the outside foot of that pass rusher was telling me something. It was it, it was telling you know that. You had to you, mm -hmm. you had people self-scouting you, I'm sure. Maybe you had a certain thing that you looked at as a at a stance. If your right foot's back or you're leaning in, you're coming. And, and that, to me, that's what film study was all about. And you can get great hints and indicators by film study. So you get over the ball and you go, hut, hut. I know exactly what Seth Joyner is doing, man. That foot's outside. He's coming, he's coming on the blitz. Those things are, to me, that's the analytics I like studying the tape. Josh, you're the best, man. I told you 20 minutes. I'm going to get you up out of here, man. Like, hey, God, you're, just getting, you're just getting me warmed up. I know, man. I know. You know what? I'm gonna have you back later on. I'm gonna have you on for the whole for the whole hour, man. That way we can just chop it all the way up, man. But I know I, I know the Phillies are on right now and you want to see it. And I got about another 15 minutes to go here. So I'm gonna let you watch the Phillies, man. I appreciate it. Are we your winning? Time, are we winning? I don't know. I don't I'm, I'm doing the same thing you're doing. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Don't you have a little screen on the side over there, man? No, you're man. I'm, I'm 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 locked in right here, man. All right, man. You're the best. All right, appreciate you, All right man. Thanks for having me. You got it. Thanks, man. We'll be back to wrap things up after this. After this break, we'll take a couple of questions and we'll wrap it all up. Are you selling your investment real estate? Are you interested in deferring your tax with the 1031 exchange? At RevX, we're experts in 1031 exchange planning and the use of passive real estate options using DSTs. Not in the midst of an exchange and want to invest in real estate, but don't know where to start? Revolution X has institutional grade real estate options for any size investor right now. Set up a consultation at RevXWealth.com. RevX, defer the tax, maximize the gain. At Mandrakia Law, we win big personal injury cases, but we always tell our clients up front that those cases almost always hinge on how much insurance coverage people or companies have. At Mandrakia Law, we don't sell insurance, but we're experts at helping our clients make sure they have the right insurance to protect their businesses and families. Do you have the right insurance? Most people don't. For a consultation, visit mmattorneys.com or call 610-584-0700. Mandrakia Law, aggressive attorneys who get the job done. This is Seth Joyner, top analyst for the birds. 
I've also analyzed the best auto dealerships, and I drive a Davis Honda. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. Over 300 cars available. And right now, get rates as low as 0.9% at Davis Honda in Burlington. Plus, you'll get two years of free oil changes on every new and used Davis Honda vehicle. See why Davis Honda continues to win outstanding awards for sales and service, including the highest award from Honda, the President's Award. Get to Davis Honda in Burlington. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. J.P. Mascaro & Sons is a family-owned, locally operated, Operated solid waste service company in business for over 60 years. You've seen the red trucks with the blue elephant that symbolizes strength and reliability. Mascaro is different than other national brands. Like the birds, Philadelphia is home. They'll take care of all your waste removal needs. They have it all. An experienced workforce, state-of-the-art equipment, a cutting-edge recycling center, and their own disposal facilities. Call 888-MASCARO or visit jpmascaro.com. Welcome back, guys. We're going to wrap the show up with a couple of questions. Just let's rapid fire them. I got about five to ten minutes here. Let's do it. So Jay, Jay wants to know, um, I want to see trips on one side, leave A.J. Brown one-on-one on the other side. DBs play off, give him a double move. Uh, press makes it come back. All right. Listen, I agree. I think that this is something in the red zone where they struggled. Um, you know, Jaws mentioned – the fact that, you know, the, the, the Eagles need to get their turnovers together. And I think that turnovers are a result. Um, they kind of come in bunches. Like the the defense, you know, turned the ball over at almost average two through the first, you know, three games of the season. In the last three or four games, you know, they're probably averaging, you know, less than one. Um, but I feel like, you know, in the red zone, um, they've got to figure that out. The turnovers in the red zone, I think, is the biggest two things that's holding this offense back. I'd also like to see Dallas Goddard in that situation where you go trips away, all three wide receivers on one side, flex Dallas Goddard out on the other side, give them, you know, the option. Make them go over there and double Dallas Goddard. Make them go over there and double, um, you know, um, A.J. Brown on that single side. And to be honest with you, if if you force them to go and and double team over there, then that's going to make them weaker in coverage on the other side. You know, you can go play action, and I'm, I promise you with some of those rub routes or bubble screens on the other side, off of the play action, you can get exactly what you want, all right? Eric wants to know, um, do I think the new safety will start this weekend against Washington? Um, it depends. It all depends on how familiar he is with um, the system that he's being asked to run. I don't know how it correlates not only on a um, – on, not only on a schematic level, but on a verbiage level, because, you know, if they're out there speaking English and, you know, he under, he hears it as Chinese, then, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to put him out there until you get him caught up. Um, as a longtime veteran, I would think that he could probably pick up on the defense pretty good. You know, situationally, there are probably some some um, some things that they can do from the standpoint of, you know, putting them in the hole, dropping them in the box and nickel situations you know, and, and communication can tell him what, what he should be doing and what he shouldn't be doing. That's possible. Um, but I don't think anybody will really know, um, until we get to Sunday, you know, the Eagles don't tip their, 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 their hand one way or the other. All right. Random Anton wants to know, we have been turning the ball over, but if we can get some of these turnovers down and start getting, start getting turnovers, it's a whole different monster. Listen, I agree. There's nothing that, um, that handicaps offenses more than turning the football over. You know, you think, you think about it. The other night, the Philadelphia Eagles, um, their defense was really only responsible for giving up seven points. The other 10 points came off a turnover. I, I believe they got, a, um, they got a field goal off of the fumble and then a touchdown off of the, um, the interception. So, I mean, you take those two turnovers away, and the Eagles, you know, they, they only give up potentially, you know, seven to ten points in this football game. That's phenomenal against a team that was averaging thirty-seven points a game. So yeah, the the, the turnovers are huge. I mean, I can't understate them. They're they're huge for the for, for how the offense operates and reacts, and it's also huge from the standpoint of how you set the offense up on a short field, or if the defense actually scores a touchdown and puts points on up on the board unaccounted for as far as the offense is concerned, all right? Um, Stu Vision wants to know, is it possible for us to use the same defensive strategy we used against the Dolphins? 
to stop and slow down the 49ers, seeing as though um, that's where Mike McDaniels came from. Hey, listen, possibly. I, I think the key is going to continue to be against these high-powered offenses. Um, and, and you've seen it with K Christian McCaffrey. Christian McCaffrey has averaged over um, 110, 115 yards um, coming into um, week number six, I think it was, against um, – Against the Cleveland Browns, I think he rushed for 50, 50 something yards. Um, in the loss last night, he rushed for 40 something yards. Um, and I think that that handicaps their entire offense from the standpoint of what Brock Purdy is comfortable doing. Um, he is a manager, in my opinion. I've been saying this all along, but you know, people couldn't see it because every once in a while he would have that game where he would supersede the numbers, um, you know, from a passing standpoint. But when they're running the ball effectively, then play action is really good for him because he goes play action and he's throwing the ball on rhythm and on time. You saw that with his first interception last night. He dropped back, went play action pass, tried to throw the ball on rhythm. The, the, the receiver wasn't where he was supposed to be, when he was supposed to be there, boom, turned into a turnover. Um, so absolutely, they can use some of this. And 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 obviously being more aggressive at the line of scrimmage with these wide receivers from time to time, because when you, when you force the release or you alter their route, that alters the timing of the route and it stops receivers from being able to hit their mark when they want to hit them. And it stops quarterbacks from being able to throw with anticipation. All right. Last question of the night goes to Michael. Michael wants to know with the acquisition of Kevin, Kevin Byer, do you see the Eagles making any more moves at the trade deadline? Why not? You know, uh, Howie is just, you know, is just pillaging the league, you know, with these moves for, you know, um, unuseful players on our roster as long as well as um, these draft picks that we have um, that are compensatory picks or extra picks that we had, you know, through other deals that have been made. Um, and if he can identify an, another position. Um, that he can pick up a quality player to help us get to not only get to the promised land, but for us to get to the promised land and close the deal. Um, I would put nothing past, you know, Harry Roseman at this point in time, because what he did yesterday, as far as um, Kevin, that Kevin by trade, listen, man, he is the magic man. He is, needs to put a ski mask on. I saw somebody said tonight, you can call it whatever you want. It's just armed robbery what he's doing to the rest of the league and they keep falling for it time after time. And our roster keeps getting better and better. All right. So listen, y'all, that's the show for tonight. I appreciate you tuning in again. Make sure you like, like, like share, tell people about, you know, the Seth Jordan show each night on Tuesday, seven 30 to eight 30 PM. Um, special thanks to all my sponsors in particular, bet parks, um, who is my title sponsor. And, um, as always, you guys take care of each other and be good to each other. Uh, but make sure that you love each other, more importantly. I'll see you guys right back here next week. Hopefully, our Phillies will be in the World Series and our Philadelphia Eagles will have moved to 7-1. and one. Peace out.